Hey everyone, welcome to today's session on inventory valuation. We're diving into a topic that might seem a little technical at first glance, but trust me, understanding how inventory is valued can give you a significant edge in analyzing financial statements. Whether you're gearing up for the CFA level one exam or just looking to sharpen your financial analysis skills, this is a key area you can't afford to overlook. Inventory valuation isn't just about crunching numbers. It's about understanding how those numbers reflect a company's financial health. The method a company uses to value its inventory can drastically alter its financial statements, affecting everything from current assets to net income. So let's break this down and see what it all means in practice. So let's kick things off by talking about why inventory valuation is such a big deal. Imagine you're trying to compare two companies in the same industry. You might think it's just a matter of looking at their financials side by side, but here's the kicker. The method each company uses to value its inventory can lead to some pretty different financial results. For example, inventory valuation directly impacts figures like current assets, total assets, and net income. This isn't just number crunching. Understanding this stuff helps you get a clearer picture of a company's financial health. Now, let's break down the different components that come into play with inventory valuation. First up, let's talk about the various costs that affect inventory. This might seem straightforward, but each of these costs can have a significant impact on how inventory is valued and, by extension, on the company's financials. Spoilage. Think about a grocery store that has to toss out expired milk. Spoilage is when inventory becomes unusable due to damage or expiration. This can lead to a reduction in the value of inventory on the balance sheet. Obsolescence. This is when inventory becomes outdated. Imagine a tech company that's still holding on to last year's smartphone models. Those devices are now less valuable because newer models have hit the market, so the company might need to write down their value. Insurance. Companies often insure their inventory to protect against risks like theft or natural disasters. The cost of this insurance can affect how inventory is valued. Declines in selling prices. Let's say a company has a bunch of widgets that were initially valued at $10 each, but the market price drops to $7. The company would need to adjust the value of this inventory downward, reflecting the lower selling price. All these factors can lead to what's called a write-down, where the company reduces the value of its inventory on the balance sheet. And guess what? That write-down also reduces profitability because it increases the cost of goods sold. Now, let's dive into how inventory is valued under two major accounting standards, IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, and US GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. This is where things get really interesting because the rules differ between these two frameworks, and that can lead to some important differences in financial reporting. Under IFRS, Companies are required to value inventory at the lower of cost or net realizable value, NRV. So what's NRV? It's basically the estimated selling price minus any costs required to complete and sell the inventory. Let's say you've got inventory initially valued at $100,000. Due to market conditions, the NRV drops to $70,000. Under IFRS, you need to write down that inventory to $70,000, and this write-down shows up in the income statement as a loss. But if the market picks back up and the NRV rises to $90,000, IFRS allows you to write the inventory back up, but only to the extent of the original write-down. So in this case, you could write it back up to $90,000, but not the original $100,000. Under U.S. GAAP, 
The rules vary depending on the inventory method. For LIFO, last in, first out, and retail methods, inventory is measured at the lower of cost or market. Here, market is usually the replacement cost, but it's subject to some boundaries. The ceiling is the NRV. The floor is NRV minus a normal profit margin. Now, let's see the key difference of U.S. GAAP from IFRS. U.S. GAAP doesn't allow for inventory to be written back up once it's been written down. Once you lower the value, that's the new cost basis. Let's say you're using LIFO, and your inventory is originally valued at $50,000. The market value drops, and you write it down to $40,000. Even if the market recovers and the value goes back up to $55,000, under U.S. GAAP, you're stuck with that $40,000 as the new cost basis. No going back up. These differences might seem small, but they can lead to significantly different financial outcomes, especially when comparing companies that report under different standards. All right, so what happens when a company writes down its inventory? Here's the deal. Profitability. A write-down directly reduces gross profit and net income. Why? Because it increases the cost of goods sold, which is subtracted from revenue to calculate profit. Balance sheet. The carrying amount of inventory on the balance sheet decreases, which in turn reduces total assets. Financial ratios. Profitability ratios like gross profit margin and net profit margin decrease because costs are higher relative to revenue. Liquidity and solvency ratios might also worsen since the company's asset base is reduced. Interestingly, a write-down can actually improve activity ratios like inventory turnover. Why? Because inventory turnover measures efficiency, and a lower inventory value due to the write-down makes it look like the company is managing its inventory more effectively, even though the write-down itself might indicate poor management. But don't let these ratios fool you. A high inventory turnover after a write-down might look good on paper, but it could be a sign that the company wasn't managing its inventory well to begin with. Industry-specific considerations. Now, in some industries like agriculture, forestry, mining, and commodities, inventory can be reported at NRV instead of historical cost. This is because these industries deal with products that have active market prices that fluctuate frequently. Active market. If there's an active market, companies can use quoted market prices to determine the fair value of their inventory. No active market. If there isn't an active market, companies might use the most recent market transaction price as a reference. In these industries, unrealized gains or losses from changes in market prices are recognized directly in the income statement, which can significantly affect short-term profitability. All right, let's dive into how economic conditions like inflation and deflation can have a significant impact on inventory valuation. This is an essential topic because the method a company uses to value its inventory can lead to vastly different financial results, depending on whether prices are going up or down. Let's start with inflation. During inflation, when prices are rising, the inventory valuation method can really affect a company's financials. If a company uses FIFO or first in, first out, it assumes that the oldest, usually the cheapest inventory, is sold first. This means the inventory that's left on the balance sheet is valued at more recent higher costs. 
So what does this mean for the company's financials? Well, with FIFO, you'll typically see the highest gross profit, operating profit, and net income. Why? Because the cost of goods sold, COGS, is lower, thanks to those older, cheaper inventory costs. But there's a trade-off. This method also results in the highest ending inventory value and consequently the highest taxes since profits are higher. Think of a supermarket chain during a period when food prices are rising. If they're using FIFO, their financials might look pretty rosy, their costs stay low, and their profits look great. But there's a downside. They're going to owe more in taxes because of those higher profits. Now let's look at LIFO, or last in, first out. This method assumes that the most recent and usually most expensive inventory is sold first. The inventory that remains on the balance sheet is therefore valued at older, cheaper costs. With LIFO, the financial results flip. You'll see the lowest gross profit operating profit and net income because the COGS is higher. Those recent purchases were more expensive. But on the bright side, this method results in the lowest taxes because the profits are lower. Imagine a similar supermarket chain using LIFO. Their income statement will show lower profits compared to a company using FIFO, but they'll save on taxes because those profits are lower. This can be a strategic choice, especially in a high tax environment. Then there's the weighted average method. This method smooths things out by averaging the cost of all inventory items. As a result, the financial metrics, profits, ending inventory, COGS, and taxes fall somewhere between FIFO and LIFO. Now, what happens during deflation? when prices are falling. The roles reverse. With FIFO, the company now reports the lowest profits because it's selling the older, higher cost inventory first. This leads to higher COGS and lower profits. With LIFO, the company benefits from the opposite effect, reporting the highest profits because it's selling the more recently acquired lower cost inventory first. And once again, the weighted average method falls in the middle, providing a balanced outcome. Remember, the economic environment, whether inflationary or deflationary, can dramatically alter how these inventory methods affect a company's financials. That's why it's so important to understand the context in which these companies are operating. Lastly, let's talk about how all this information is presented and disclosed in financial statements. This part is just as crucial as understanding the numbers themselves because how a company reports its inventory can affect your analysis. Under IFRS, companies need to disclose their accounting policies for inventory measurement. This includes details like the total carrying amount of inventory and a breakdown by category, whether that's raw materials, work in progress, or finished goods. They also have to disclose the amount of inventory recognized as an expense, which is basically your COGS. And if there are any write-downs or reversals, those need to be disclosed too, along with the circumstances that led to any reversals. Plus, if any inventory has been pledged as collateral, that information must be shared as well. Under US GAAP, the requirements are similar, but there are a few key differences. For example, reversals of write-downs aren't allowed under US GAAP, so companies don't need to disclose them. However, they must disclose any significant estimates applied to inventories, and if a company has earned significant income from the liquidation of LIFO inventory, that also needs to be disclosed. Now, let's talk about inventory ratios because these are the tools you'll use to assess how efficiently a company is managing its inventory. 
First, there's the inventory turnover ratio, which is calculated as COGS divided by average inventory. This ratio tells you how efficiently a company is managing its inventory. A high turnover ratio usually indicates efficient management, but you need to be careful. It could also suggest that the company is understocking, which might lead to lost sales. Then there's days of inventory on hand, DOH. This ratio is like the flip side of turnover. It tells you how many days on average inventory stays on hand before being sold. A lower DOH suggests efficient management, but again, it could indicate that the company is at risk of stockouts. In industries with thin margins like retail, these ratios are crucial. A company with high turnover and low DOH might look efficient, but if they run out of stock at the wrong time, they could lose sales to competitors. On the other hand, a company with too much inventory might have a bloated balance sheet and face higher costs from spoilage or obsolescence. And that's the big picture on how inflation, deflation, and presentation requirements can influence inventory valuation. Understanding these factors is key to making informed analyses and preparing for your CFA Level 1 exam. Keep practicing and this will all start to click. And there you have it, inventory valuation in a nutshell. Understanding how inventory is valued, reported, and disclosed can give you a much clearer picture of a company's financial health. Remember, the methods a company chooses can significantly impact its financial statements and ratios, which in turn affects your analysis. So, when you're tackling those CFA Level 1 questions, keep this lecture in mind. Think about how inventory valuation plays out in real-world scenarios, and you'll be well on your way to mastering this topic. Good luck and keep practicing those examples. It'll all pay off on exam day.